Good morning and welcome to Low Country Community Church. My name is Lolly Mole. I'm one of the worship volunteers here. And I wanna thank you for spending part of your weekend here with us, especially if this is one of your first times to be here. We love it when you share your Sunday experience online, so make sure you tag us, hashtag LCC, when you post pictures. Also, please take a second to silence your cell phones. But parents, keep your phone handy so the children's ministry can text you if they need to get a hold of you. Service will be starting soon, so as you're finding your seat, please make room for everyone by scooting towards the center of your row. Now, if you haven't already, please find your seat. Today is gonna be so awesome.
director here and I want to thank you for spending part of your weekend at LCC. Especially if you're newer here, there's a special gift just for you at the Blue Tents. So grab your phone and text Hey LCC. That's all one word to 99000. This will let the volunteers know that you're coming so they can set back a gift for you just as a way to say thanks for being here. Today, Pastor Jeff is wrapping up this message series called In God We Trust with a message about how we can put our trust in God to provide for each of us. One of the ways I like to look at his provision is by looking at how he's building a community of people to help each of us out. And ladies, I am so excited to invite you to an event that's completely designed to help you build that community. On Friday, March 1st, Nicole Eunice will be right here at LCC, right here for a night that will help you discover how to find joy in the screw-ups, the letdowns, and the downright ridiculous stuff that happens in our lives. Take out your phone and text LCC Women, all one word, to 99000 to sign up and to get more information. Soon, we're going to continue to worship God through our giving, and I want to thank you for trusting God by giving to Him through LCC. Your gifts not only help fund the everyday mission at LCC, but you are helping LCC partner with other ministries in the area to make a difference for the Low Country. Here's a look at how your gifts are changing lives. As you know, we have partnered with Bluffton Self Help many, many times over the years for some great projects and worthwhile things. And we wanted to come down here and visit you today so that you would know more about what Bluffton Self Help does. They have been serving our community for over 30 years. And as you know, our church has made a new commitment that we started this last fall about for the low country. Community is our middle name, and nobody is serving our community in a greater way than Bluffton Self Help. So thank you for being here. This is the executive director, Kimberly Hall. And I just wanted you to tell our folks about what you do here, how many people you serve, the kind of programs you have. So we serve about 5,000 Bluffton residents here annually through our food program, emergency financial assistance, clothing, in which we're standing here in our Education and Resource Center. And we couldn't do all that work we do without your support and the support of all your wonderful folks here. Tell us a little bit about, we, we know you do food drives, we've helped with that, clothing, mm -hmm. shoes. Tell us a little bit about, we toured their wonderful Education and Resource Center yeah. next door. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Resource Center really is a place-based um, service center in which folks can get everything from business services, um, resume building, uh, credit counseling. It's just, it's a resource center meant to help engage folks in the resources, tools, support that they need to find their pathway to success. Put them on a permanent path for yes, success. That's for sure. great. Well, just know that we are going to be partnering on an even, deep, even deeper level with Bluffton Self-Help this year. So just know that you're gonna keep hearing more about them. We're gonna be looking for opportunities for you to get involved, not just through your giving, but also serving. So thank you for being thank here with you. us today. We love what you do. You. 
and uh, our community is better because of it. Oh, thank you. Thanks we love so you. much. Bluffton Self Help will have tables in the lobby this morning. Make sure to stop by and see how you can get involved helping them out through LCC. I want to thank you again for giving to God through LCC. What we're giving together as a church matters because what we're doing together as a church matters. Let's stand this morning as we pray together for our offering. Father, we're thankful this morning to be in your house, to be in your presence today. Lord, we ask now that you would bless this offering that we're about to give. Help us, the church, be wise with what we're giving. Help us, Lord, to reach the people who do not know you. Lord, we're thankful for what you're doing in this house and in this city and in this world. Lord, we love you and we're here to worship you. Let's continue to worship this morning as we give.
Let's pray. Father, we're thankful this morning to be in your presence, to be in this house with one another, to share in this moment together, worshiping you, giving you glory, giving you honor. Father, our eyes are fixed on you. And as we continue to worship through listening to your word, Lord, I pray that you just remove any distraction that we may have so that we're able to focus in very clear on you and the truth of your word. We want to know more of you. That's why we're here this morning. We love you and we thank you for your blessings. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Wonderful to see you. Aren't you glad and appreciate the people that lead us in worship week after week after week after week? It just blesses me to stand back there and uh, in the shadows and look out, watch you worship, listen to you worship. It's a pretty neat vantage point. Good morning. My name is Jeff Cranston, the lead pastor here at Low Country, and we are so delighted that you're here today on this beautiful, warm, and sunny morning here in South Carolina. Uh, whether you're in here, out in the concourse, or watching online, we are very grateful that you have decided to join us in worship. For the past two weeks or so, we have been talking about trust and the provision of God in our lives. And I want to begin this morning by just reminding us of a few ways we practice or exercise trust in our own lives. And in a minute, you're going to turn to the person near you and you're going to talk for about 15 seconds. So prepare yourselves. Some of you right now, you're thinking 15 seconds, that's an eternity. Others of you, there's no way you'll ever get it in in 15 seconds. But um, just some, I, you know, the ways we practice trust. I heard a story of a, in a farming community in the Midwest and a drought was beginning to take its toll on the crops and the townspeople all gathered for a, a prayer meeting to pray for rain. Uh, but as the story goes, only one person, a young boy, brought an umbrella to the prayer meeting. That's trust. That's what I'm saying. Uh, every night we go to bed without any assurance at all of being alive the next morning, but still we set the alarm. We practice trust in our lives. Uh, when you playfully toss a toddler in the air, uh, playfully, you know, not launch them into the ceiling fan, playfully <laughs> toss them, and they're laughing and they're giggling, uh, knowing that you are going to catch them again. Think about it. If somebody was doing that to you, would you really be laughing out loud like a little baby does? That's, they're exercising trust. And most, if not all of us, and I hope all of us do, have a person or some people in our lives whom we trust. Think about it for a moment. Who do you trust? Who's in your life that, you know what, when it comes down to it, I trust him or I trust her? That's what you're going to say to one another. Turn to the person nearest to you and tell them who you trust and why you trust that person. Ready? Go. Go. Okay, switch. And cut. 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 I hope you had somebody. I hope it, uh, you know, just makes you thankful we, to have those kind of people in our lives that, you know, when I... When I need something, when I have to speak to somebody, when I, I have to go somewhere, I know I can go to this individual. And that's a wonderful thing to have in our lives. Have you under, ever wondered why you trust that person? Have you ever wondered about trusting God? You know, trust is a, it, it's so internalized, isn't it? It's, it's something uh, uh, that sometimes it's hard for you and I to define it. You know, trust is the kind of thing, I, I know it when I feel it, I know it uh, innately, but I sometimes find it hard to define. But uh, I ran across and listened to a popular professor at the Harvard Business School, uh, a woman named Frances Fry, and she speaks a lot on trust in the workplace. And I, as I listened, I thought, man, this really can mean a lot for us. And she says that... Um, 
So how do you like this? We're fancy today, aren't we? Got a board and everything. She says trust can be um, sort of defined in, in, in three ways. And authenticity is at the, at the top. And then logic. Sorry, this is going to be crooked. And then the word empathy. So empathy, logic, and authenticity. It says when all three things are present and they're healthy in, in your life in, in terms of you trusting another person, th- these are the things that really work within us to help us trust someone so, or to have someone trust us. So if you are being 100% authentic with somebody, they have a sense of trust toward you. you you're being yourself, in other words. Logic, you know, the way that you think and the way that you process information as they watch and hear you do that, that brings about an element of trust in that individual towards you. And uh, empathy is if I, I have th- those sorts of feelings toward you, that I'm really in it for you and that I'm really caring and concerned about you. My heart is toward you. So if you have all three of these things taking place, you've really got a good, solid bond of trust going on with that other person. If any one of these three things gets wobbly, that's when trust starts to break down. When people get a sense that you are not who you really are, or you're portraying yourself to be someone whom you really are not... We all have a sense of that, right? Have you ever been around somebody and you're thinking, man, this, this person kind of feels phony. I don't, I don't know that I'm getting the true person here. Now, with the people that you know really well and know you really well, you're probably being very authentic. The problem comes when we go to deal with people who are different from us, and then we have this sense, or I gotta, I've got to be something toward them, and when we're really not, they, they pick up on it. The challenge with that is every day we meet people who are different from us. That's always the challenge. Logic, if it's faulty or I'm not communicating my logic well, then trust gets a li- the, trust get, or the logic part gets wobbly, and um, I don't know that I can trust the person because what they're saying doesn't always make sense to me. Or maybe it's just rock solid logic, but they're not communicating it well to you or you to them. And so trust begins to break down. Empathy is when you think, you know what? I know they say they're really for me, but I don't don't think they're really for me. Or I don't think this person is really totally 100% committed to me. And so those three areas are really, really important every time we talk about trust. And when any of those three things gets a little bit wobbly, that's when trust begins to break down. So we're going to take a look at the word trust this morning. Now, we have been in a, in a, in a series called In God We Trust, and uh, we are just going to take the word trust today in the biblical viewpoint, and we've been talking about giving, and today's the last message in this series. Uh, we're going to take the word trust as an acrostic and break it down and help define it within the biblical viewpoint when it comes to giving, when it comes to managing the resources financially that God gives us, and we're going to break it down as it comes to tithing. So let's just take a look at the word trust. Let's begin with the letter T. And let's say that T stands for take an inventory. Take an inventory. Now we're talking about the finances that God gives us in our lives. Let's begin right there. Know where you are financially. Get a plan. Proverbs 27 says, know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. Now, maybe there's a couple in here, but I would guarantee, uh, I would guess, not guarantee, but guess that 99.5% of us in here don't have herds or flocks. Would I be close? All right, so you read that and go, well, that doesn't have anything to do with me. Well, look at the principle behind it. Know the condition of your flocks. Pay attention to your herds. Those were flocks and herds were financial resources. That was money. I know they were animals, but they raised them in order to get money and bring uh, support for the family. So know the condition well. Understand and take a personal inventory. Be a wise steward. 
manage your resources wisely. So know where every dollar is going and give it a name. And you tell your money where to go. You stay out of debt. You budget well. And for some of you, you're doing that. And others of you are thinking, I, I wish I could do that. Well, you can. And we, we offer a class here on a very consistent basis at Low Country called uh, Financial Peace University. Get into the next one if you've never been in it. Over 2,000 people have gone through it in the last 10 years or so here at our church. If you have been through it and you got off the plan, get back in it and get back on that budget and um, make Dave Ramsey a bad word in your ha family again. It's a good thing when you're saying, what would Dave do? That will really help you a lot. Um, but if you're financially in a mess right now, there is a way out. And I want to tell you there, there's hope and it begins with taking an inventory and then getting yourself on a plan. And Financial Peace University will help you do that. That's the letter T, take an inventory. Let's look at the letter R. Letter R, recognize God as our source. Now we have been looking at that, that concept, that principle over the last two weeks. And God gives it all to us. Everything that we have comes from his hand. And let me just remind you, financially, as uh, maybe, maybe you're facing some pretty dark days financially right now, God is able. God is able. And you trust him, but you recognize him as your source. It all comes from him. Everything we face in life, God is able. He's the source of everything that we have. T-R-U, the letter U, understand God's principles. Understand his principles when it comes to finances. There are so many principles throughout scripture that deal with stewardship, management, money, our attitude, our heart toward those things. So let me just briefly mention a, a few to you, principles of God regarding finances and financial management. First one is this, God is the owner, I'm the manager. If we just understand that and live in that framework, man, will things go better for us. God is the owner of it all, and I am the manager of it. And every obedient follower of Jesus understands and lives by that principle. Every resource and blessing that you and I have today is from the hand of God because he is the original owner of it all. Scriptures point that out to us. We'll, we'll run through some real quick here. Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 8, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth. The power to make wealth that you have comes from God. There's that owner-manager deal. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains the world and those who dwell in it. He owns it all. Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Owns it all, comes from him. For you have been bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20. So God says, I have bought you with a price. What is that? That's the precious blood of his son. And it's a beautiful picture. But he said, you have been redeemed. I have bought you back. What does that mean? I was in slavery. I was in bondage. I was chained by what? Sin. Sin. And he bought us, he paid the ransom for us and has not only set us free, but declared us free forevermore. That's good stuff. And then for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God giving, the owner who gives it all to us in the person of his son. Paul reminds the Corinthians, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. And so there we are, we're, we're taught that we are stewards of what God has given to us. So that's the, the owner manager kind of principle that permeates scripture. Second principle, as we're understanding these principles, is the giving precedes growth principle. Practicing giving produces spiritual growth. Practicing giving at any level, whether it's your, your time, talent, or treasure, precedes uh, growth, spiritual growth. Heard a cute story of a young lady. She taught swim lessons. Her name was Miss Tawny. And uh, she's taught swimming lessons to children. And uh, you've been in indoor pools many, many times. You know that rope that goes across the pool that separates the shallow end from the deep end? You remember that, 
that one. Uh, that was always up as she was giving students swimming lessons in the shallow end of the pool. But as the students became proficient enough in their swimming, Miss Tawny would remove the rope separating the shallow end from the deep end. And uh, usually this would make the students a little bit nervous. You can uh, certainly understand that. And that was shown one day in particular by a little boy who saw her remove the rope and he said, Miss Tawny, please put the rope back up. The deep water is getting into the shallow water. <laughs> and we laugh at that, but we're really no different, are we? Our, our Father in heaven may challenge us to a newer level of growth by moving out of our comfort zone and our response is, Lord, please put that rope back up because the deep water is getting into the shallow water. See, we don't grow until we give. We don't grow until we step into new zones of, uh, that you move out of the comfort zone into a trust zone. You move out of the comfort zone into a faith zone. And then the trust grows in God. And as the trust in God grows, it produces spiritual growth in your heart. There's another principle, the fountain, we'll just call it the fountain of youth principle. Wouldn't you love to know the fountain of youth principle? Um, we live forever through our giving. We live forever through our giving. As you give your time, your, your talent, your tithe, these are the only things that last forever. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Now let's look at the other two words in, in our, our word trust. T, R, and U, and see how we can apply God's principles to our lives. The letter S, S stands for surrender everything to God. Surrender everything to God. Have you ever heard anyone say this, or perhaps have you ever thought this? And I think, in honesty, uh, we probably all have at some level. Have you ever thought this or heard this said, if I only had more, I would give more? That's coming from a place of good intention, but if I only had more, I'd give more. Maybe you're like this guy. Watch the, uh, watch the screens. I, I would like to give. I would, okay? But everything right now is just crazy. I mean, just crazy, you know? I mean, not normal crazy, really crazy, you know? And if after I paid my bills and took care of the things that I need and want, then I would, I would consider giving something, but not, now's crazy. We're, we're, we're going to give later. We've already talked about it. I mean, down the road, we'll be crazy givers, but right now it's just crazy. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, we've all been there a little bit, haven't we? Uh, and Luke 16, we read a little bit about this way of thinking. Jesus said, he, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in what? Much. He who's faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. What does that mean? What does that mean is, what that means is, if you are not giving to God from what you have now, you will not give sacrificially when you have more. If I'm not doing it now, I won't do it later. If I'm not doing now with whatever I have, if I come into this you know, big pile of resources later, I'm still not going to do it. I'm either going to do it now or almost never. That's what he's talking about here. Because there's a spiritual principle in our lives at work, and it shows us it's not how much we have of the world that dictates our generosity to God, but how much God has of us. It's not how much we have of the world that dictates our generosity toward God. It's how much God has of us. So the question I need to wrestle with is this one. Look at it up on the screens. Am I going to live like the world and basically trust in myself and become independent and do my own thing? Or am I going to live under the biblical principles God has for me? Am I going to live like the world and basically trust in myself become independent, do my own thing, or am I going to live under the biblical principles that God has for me? Is he going to be my source? Is he going to be my provider, or am I going to trust in myself? Am I going to do it myself? Am I going to pave my own way, pull myself up by my own bootstraps, or that's the independent person, 
or am I going to live as a dependent person, trusting in God as my source and my provider? See, the issue is not about ability. The issue is not about what I have. The issue is not about money. The issue is, in whom do I trust? Do I trust in myself, or am I going to trust in God? And that's it. It's very simple. It's either I trust myself completely, or I trust in God completely. Surrender. The letter T stands for test God's promises. Test God's promises. If you're doing without in some of the areas of your need, I can almost promise you without condition, you can go right back to an area of trust. If you're doing without right now in an area of need, I think I, I, I can almost promise you if you go back to the, to the foundation of that, it will point you to an area into which you have failed to trust God as your provider. Author and former pastor John Maxwell illustrates how every great Bible character had to go through God's trust test. Let, let me just briefly show you a few. Let's begin with Noah. Noah passed the trust test. He trusted in God, not the familiar. God told him to what? Noah, build an ark because it's going to rain and I'm going to flood the earth. That had never happened before. And so Noah says, okay, there's the trust test. Never flooded before. Noah, can you imagine the neighbors? Noah, what are you doing? What, what in the world, Noah? Well, it's, God's going to send so much rain, it's going to flood the earth. Everybody's going to die except whoever's on that boat. Now, you think you live next to a crazy neighbor? <laughs> and if you don't live next to a crazy neighbor, you are the crazy neighbor. You understand that, right? <laughs> but see, Noah obeyed and he trusted God. And we read, Noah did everything the Lord commanded him. How, how I would love that to be written on my tombstone. How about you? He did, she did everything the Lord commanded her or him to do. That's what he did. And because of that, he passed the trust test. Lucy Bennett wrote a few lines that Noah would likely have said a big amen to. It's an old hymn. Trust him when dark doubts assail you. Trust him when your strength is small. Trust him when to simply trust him seems the hardest thing of all. Trust him he is ever faithful. Trust him for his will is best. Trust him for the heart of Jesus is the only place of rest. Trust him. Noah passed the test. How about Abraham? Abraham passed the trust test. He trusted in God, not personal feelings. What was his trust test? Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. They're climbing up Mount Moriah, Isaac and Abraham. And Isaac says, hey, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And you remember Abraham's response? God will provide. God will provide, son. Whenever the Lord assigns a difficult task, he provides you and I what we need to carry it out. Abraham's son is laid upon the altar, and it looks like He's to be the sacrifice, and then suddenly heaven speaks, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Noah and Abraham passed the trust test. How about Joshua? Joshua passed the trust test. He trusted in God and not methods not methods. The Israelites under Joshua had to pass through the Red Sea. Now Moses, who was before Joshua, Moses always had a rod to do this stuff. Uh, he, Moses would hold the rod up in the air and miracles would happen. And it, it was so powerful that uh, one time during a battle, he's holding it up and Israel's winning. And if it lowered, Israel started to lose. And so two men came alongside and held his arms up in the air to keep the rod up in the air because miracles happened. But Joshua didn't have a rod. 
You can almost hear the Israelites saying, hey, Joshua, you know, we're with you and all man, but where's the rod? You know, uh, Moses always had a rod. And, um, you know, when it came to stuff like this, he had the rod. Where's the rod? Well, this time, no rod. And they had to get in the water before anything happened. And Joshua didn't have that rod because God didn't want them trusting in anything but him. He didn't want them trusting in methods. And Joshua trusted God and the people followed that and the water parted. Now it came about when all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed that their hearts melted And there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. Abraham, Joshua, Noah passed the trust test. And you and I have to pass the trust test as well. In what area in your life right now is the trust test happening? One of the major areas we all face is in the area of money and our giving and tithing. So we're going to wrap this series up today, end this message up, by seeing how we do on one of God's trust tests. So last week we looked at Malachi 3, you might remember, where God issued an indictment to his people or against his people and then made a promise to his people. And the indictment was, he said, God said, you're robbing me. And they said, robbing you? How in the world are, are we robbing you? And God's answer was what, do you remember? In tithes and in offerings. And they went, oh yeah. That was the indictment. And God said, however, I'm gonna make y'all a promise. He made him a threefold promise, a promise which stands true this day for you and for me. Malachi 3.10, here's the first part. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. This is God talking. And you say, Pastor Jeff, are you telling me that God will take care of me in every area of my life, including finances, if I put him first? No, I am not telling you that. God is telling you that. This is not Cranston's trust test. This is not Low Country Community Church's trust test. This is God's trust test. And he says, it's the only place in the Bible we're, tell, we're told we can do this. Test me in this, he says. He will provide. So he will provide for you. That's the first part of the promise. When you put him first in this area, in, in tithing, he says, I'll provide for you. Here's the second part. He will protect you. He will protect you. Verse 11, then I will, let me try this again. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. Your life will be blessed by God and he will protect you. That's the third part of the promise. He's going to, provide. He's going to protect. And he says, I'm going to bless. I'm going to bless you. Verse 12, all the nations will call you blessed for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Remember those three areas of trust. If any of these start to wobble, then trust begins to break down. Apply that to this right now. Is God authentic? I mean, can you, can you trust him? Is he, is he a, a, what he says he means? What he says he will do? How about empathy? Is he for you? Oh, yeah, man, I feel that. I feel God's authentic. Here's what I think. When it comes to tithing and when it comes to giving, where it breaks down for a lot of us is this logic. It doesn't make sense. 10%. I'm looking at my statement. This does not make sense, and we get scared, and we stop trusting him. And God wants you 
to step up to this thing and write in here. Now, the Harvard professor doesn't include this on her lecture. Faith and trust. And for most of us, it breaks down when it comes to giving at the logic deal because it just doesn't make sense on paper. And God said, well, hold on now. I didn't say it had to make sense to you. I just said, trust me. Just trust me. Will you trust him? So here we're going to end. And you were given a card when you came in today. Everybody get a card? You've already cheated. You've already looked at it. We've done this many times at this church before. But here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to issue us all a challenge. Now, my wife Darlene and I, we, we tithe. We have tithed for 35 and a half years. But here's the challenge. If you're not tithing, we're going to offer you a 90-day challenge at this church, and I'm going to read it to you. Oh, I should have brought my glasses. Cindy, maybe if you held this for me, I could read it from there. Let me get to where I, okay, right there. I would like to test God's faithfulness, Malachi 3.10, by accepting the 90-day tithe challenge. Here it is. I agree that for a 90-day period, that takes us to May the 24th, I believe that's the day. My household will contribute to God through LCC, a tithe equal to 10% of her income. At the end of the 90-day period, if I am not convinced of God's faithfulness to bless my life as a result of my obedience to his word, then I will be entitled to request a refund up to the full amount of verifiable contributions made during that 90-day period. This church believes in tithing. We believe God protects. We believe God blesses. We believe God will provide. So here's what we'll say to you. If you'll do this for 90 days, let us know that you're going to do it. So you fill this out, and uh, we'll, we'll collect these at the end of the service. And make verifiable contributions. So don't come in 90 days and say, I gave $10,000 in cash, and I wanted it back. That ain't going to work, okay? We got to know that you gave and, and what you gave, okay? And uh, so to begin, I will mark my first tithe, 90-day challenge, or contact Corey Wilbur. She's our business manager here. So my commitment represents this, a tithe or a step up towards tithing. You say, well, we're giving 3%. So as we move toward a full tithe, we're going to increase it to 5%. But here's what I really, you know what I really want to do? I want to take a marker and wipe through the step up to tithing. Because God really never gives us that option. But for some of us, I mean, we're, we're you know, we're just so far from where God wants us to be. That would be a huge step for you. So it's, I, and I think, again, it's not the amount. It's the step of faith. It's the step of trust. Do I believe him to do what he says he will do? We believe it. And so at the end of 90 days, if you can in good conscience say, you know what, God did not provide for me. God did not live up to his promises. You come back to us and we will give you every cent back after 90 days that, that you gave that we can you know, verify. Is that, is that clear? So think about that. Pray about it. I want to challenge you to, to, to fill it out and to do it. And give us an email address because um, what we're going to do is I'm going to send you an email once a week for 90 days, just once a week. Uh, we won't do anything else with your email address. We're not selling it to some list or anything. And we'll share that, that group of people, and there should be, I don't know, the hundreds, I hope, and we'll share the stories of God's provision. The stories that will come into this church of God's provision over the next 90 days are going to be incredible. They're going to be miraculous. And you know why? Because you stepped out and started living in the faith zone. You started living in the trust zone. And God says, test me. So you say, okay, God, I, I'll, I'll take you up on it. So it's a good thing to do. It's a good challenge. It's a good way to grow spiritually. And uh, if, if this promise out of Malachi 3 isn't true, I'm going home. I'll go work for a club or I'll go back to carpentry. But I believe this word to be true. I know he provides. I've seen it in my own life for 35 and a half years. And he'll do it for you. He will provide for you. I talked to a young man, I think it was just last Sunday. And he said, you know, I, I, started, I started to tithe. And he then unfolded a just an almost immediate and miraculous provision of God in his life. And he said, you know, I don't know that any of that would have happened had I not stepped out 
into faith. Sometimes you've got to step out into the water before the seas part. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the blessings you give us. God, you are the blesser. Everything we have comes from you. You've given us so much. You've blessed us, and you call us to bring the first tenth back to you. We thank you for what you're doing in our church, how you're using people in this faith community to be a blessing to the overall community in which we live, to our nation, to the world. So, Father, as we prepare to give back to you the 10% that you call us to give, speak to our hearts, speak to us that we need to take this challenge if we're to get zoned in, to grow spiritually. God, if you need to take us to the next level of living, to take us to the next level of giving, take us to the next level of faith or trust, we ask you to do that. And can you, as you're seated there, would you, Just quietly pray right now. Say, God, I want to do what you want me to do. Strengthen me, embolden me. Increase my faith, Lord, as I accept this 90-day challenge. We pray together in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. So let me invite you to fill this out. Fill it out before you leave. In this room, there will be people at the doors to receive these. Out in the lobby, you can take it over to the coffee counter. If you're online, you can just email us and let us know, and then you can start giving online that way. But seriously consider this. And then we're going to start practicing tithing next Sunday. Next Sunday is Everyone Tithe Sunday, so we're all going to just come together and, and, and tithe that Sunday and get started and crank this thing off like that. And then as a church, we're going to tithe next Sunday's offering and tithe that to some of our mission partners, and we'll tell you uh, what we're going to do next Sunday before we take the offering. God bless you as you step out in faith.
receive the cards and if you're in the concourse you can drop those off in the giving stations and we also want to remind you that we have prayer teams here at the front um, left and right of stage um, if you need prayer this morning we hope to see each and every one of you here next week have a great day